so short little chapter tonight, and this begins in verse 1, ask. <laughs> ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. It is the Lord who makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants to the of the field to everyone. So this is an invitation God is telling his people, you need to to ask of me, I'm the one that provides the rain. Um, throughout Israel's history, even today, Israel is a pretty dry and arid region, and especially back in those days, they absolutely had to depend on the rains, which came twice a year. You had the spring rains and the fall rains, and of course you had the planting seasons in each the early spring and the early fall, and uh, you, you absolutely depended on those rains uh, for your crops to grow because no crops, no food. And so this is one of the things that Israel fell into that trap of idolatry because when they moved into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the chief god of the land of Canaan was the, was the god Baal, B-A-A-L. And he was also known as the storm god. And so he was responsible supposedly for sending the rain. And um, so remember they've, were taken away from their land into captivity for several years. They've come back. And, and in the meantime, that land has been resettled by other nations. And so there's still this tendency, you know, uh, when Ezra showed up in the land, the, pro uh, the priest and prophet Ezra, he was shocked and abhorred <laughs> that the people had begun to intermarry with the surrounding nations. Some of them weren't even speaking the language of, of Hebrew anymore. And so they always fell prey to that. And the other nations worshiped other gods. So even though this, this remnant has come back, there are still those among the Jews living at this time in Judah who are still being lured away by idolatry. And so God's reminding them, hey, 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 <laughs> you need to ask me. Ask the Lord. Be bold enough to ask. If you need rain, ask me. Now, remember, I took you to Hosea before, you know, when they had stopped building the temple. And one of the things God did to get their attention was withhold rain. And so there was drought. And God said, I did that. And so now they, they're obeying God. But, you know, God knows our heart, and so he's warning them and reminding them, don't fall into the same trap again. You need the rain. You need to ask me for the rain in the springtime. And I love this verse because it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. It tells us that he, the Lord, makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants of the field to everyone. Remember what Jesus said, that, that God shines his sun on the evil and the good. And he sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, or the just and the unjust. So that's just the kindness of the Lord, that he's faithful to send rain to the whole world. But then there's this contrast in why he's saying, you need to ask me, so they won't do what probably some of them have been doing, verse 2. He confronts the idols that they're trusting in. The idols speak deceit. Diviners see visions that lie. So diviners were those that would seek to contact the spirits of these idols in order to interpret the future in some way. That's what the diviners were. It says they tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep oppressed for lack of a shepherd. So instead of trusting in the good shepherd, the Lord their God, the faithful God, the one who is the one that makes the rain and sends it, he's warning them about, about these false idols, these diviners, uh, things that they're, they're putting their trust in that are just empty, false promises and false hope. And because of that, where does that leave them as a people? They wander like sheep, oppressed for lack of a shepherd. So there's this indirect reference here to, once again, the shepherds. Who were the shepherds? The leaders and the rulers over the people. Not only the, the Jewish leadership, but even, you know, this is the Medo-Persian Empire. And so those governors and other officials that are in place and even the surrounding nations that can negatively influence them. And so this is, 
you know, God has to raise up faithful leaders, faithful prophets and priests like Zechariah to confront them with the truth. And verse 3, God tells us how he feels about this when his people are once again being led astray. Verse 3, my anger burns against the shepherds. Again, the shepherds, again, it's just another metaphor for the rulers and the leaders and the officials over the people, prophets, priests, and other leaders. He says, I will punish the leaders. The literal word there in the Hebrew that's used is as a male goat. So in, in addressing these shepherds, these unfit shepherds, and saying he's going to you know, his anger burns against them. Why? Because you are corrupting my sheep. You are misleading them. You are deceiving them. And I tell you, if there's any time that God gets fired up in scripture, it's when he sees his people being led astray by those who are, are placed over them to be their leaders. And especially when it was in Judah, God's king, God's rulers, the prophets and the priests who should have been leading them in the ways of the Lord led them astray and often for their own gain and taking advantage of them. And, you know, uh, I think I stuck in here in this uh, lesson. Yeah, Jeremiah 23. So when you got to that, if you read, if you were to read through like most of chapter 23 in Jeremiah, the Lord is fired up. <laughs> And if there's any, I say that Jeremiah 23 is like the Old Testament counterpart to Matthew 23 when God just, whoo, he like lights up the scribes and the Pharisees and he, and he gives those seven woes, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for all the ways that they are misleading his people, these religious rulers. And so you can see if there's one thing that gets God steamed angry, very angry, it's when, when leadership that he has put in place is misleading his people, especially to their harm. So God says his anger burns and he's going to punish them. And here's what he's going to do instead for the Lord Almighty. Remember that means the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty will care for his flock, the house of Judah. And in direct contrast to being these poor, corrupted sheep, he's saying he's going to make them like a proud horse in battle. This is one of God's promises that, that he is going to rescue and care for his people. And we're going to read about this a little further on and even get into this more in the next chapter that when you go to Ezekiel and read in Ezekiel chapter 34, a long chapter where God confronts the, the false shepherds for what they're doing to his people. And he holds them accountable and he's going to punish them for that. At the same time, he goes into lengthy detail about all that he's going to do for his flock. And so remember, Ezekiel prophesied during that 70 year captivity. So the people of Judah should recall whenever, uh, even now, Zechariah using these references and these promises that God makes as being a shepherd and he is going to care for the flock of his people, that should ring a bell for them about all the things that God spoke through Ezekiel that he will do. So now he's reiterating those same promises and here he's just briefly saying, it's going to happen. I'm going to care for my flock. And ultimately God's going to make them like a proud horse in battle, strong, raring to go. And then here's how this will ultimately come about. Verse four, from Judah will come the cornerstone from him. So this cornerstone re refers to a him and from him, the tent peg, the battle bow from him, every ruler. So from Judah, this might ring a bell from your old Testament history from Judah will come the cornerstone. Now, if you've been in church and you sung a lot of church song, you know that Jesus is the cornerstone, right? We've, we read that clearly in the New Testament, but that's a reference to the Old Testament. And if you want to keep your finger here, let me take you all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 49. So first book of the Bible, Genesis 49. So Jacob, just before he died, he blessed each of his 12 sons with a specific blessing. 
And one of the more lengthy blessings he gave was to Judah. And Judah was the, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, fourth son <laughs> born to Jacob. But look at what he says in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. He says, the scepter will not depart from Judah. So they're still in Egypt at this time. This is when Jacob has come to join Joseph and brought the whole family there. And they're going to be there for 400 years before God leads them out. So this is before, they're, but this is before the Exodus even occurs, all right? This is before there's ever a king in Israel, long before. And God prophesied through the mouth of Jacob that from Judah, the scepter, the ruling scepter will not depart, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. Other translations say until Shiloh comes, until the prince of peace comes and the obedience of the nation is his. So from the beginning of their history, we know that a ruler is going to come from Judah. And then the verse often quoted at Christmas time, you know, when the wise men came searching for this baby boy who's born king of the Jews and Herod had to consult, you know, the priest to find out, has there been anything written in the scriptures about where this child, this Messiah is to be born? And they say, they, they search and they go, oh yeah, in Micah, Micah chapter five. So Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. They prophesied in the same time frame. So again, long before either captivity. And in Micah five, verse two, it says specifically, but you Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are still small among the clans of Judah. So not only is this, this, cornerstone, this coming one, this Messiah coming from Judah, but it tells the specific town where he's going to be born. You Bethlehem Ephrata, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me the one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And other translations say from eternity. So there are several more, but those are just two of the very clear references that there's coming a Messiah from the tribe of Judah. And then it uses a couple more uh, metaphors about him. First, it says he, from him, from Judah comes the cornerstone. Now, I meant to put this verse in your questions, and, and I don't know why it slipped my mind. I was using a study guide, and I used the references that were in there, and then I thought, well, that said capstone, not to be confused by the capstone. It's just a, that's more like the top stone versus the cornerstone. But um, here's another one you can turn to, Isaiah chapter 28. So if you go back a few books, it's kind of easy to find Isaiah. It's a big, long book. Isaiah 28. Verse 16, this is the primo Old Testament scripture about the Messiah being the cornerstone, the Messiah from Judah being the cornerstone. So Isaiah 28, verse 16 says this, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay in a stone in Zion. Where's Zion? Jerusalem. Where's Jerusalem. It's the capital of Judah. <laughs> so here we got that cornerstone coming from Judah. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. There it is. For a sure foundation. And the one who trusts will never be dismayed. This is a metaphor again for the Messiah. The one who trusts in him, this cornerstone, will never be put to shame. So from Judah, this is how God's going to bring about this great deliverance and care for his people. It's going to be through the Messiah from Judah, who's called the cornerstone. From him, the tent peg. Think of what a tent peg was. Okay, remember their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they dwelled in tents. Well, how did you secure those tents? With tent pegs. You stretched that tent out, and you had ropes, and they were tied to a sturdy, secure peg in the ground that kept that tent strong and kept it from falling down. So to use a metaphor that from him is the tent peg, that means think of him being the anchor for the soul. 
He's solid, he's firm, he's steadfast, he's secure. So from him comes the tent peg, comes that security that we have that we can rely on. Also from him, the battle bow. Well, what's a battle bow, okay? That's a weapon of warfare. And we learned last week that he is showing up as a mighty warrior, right? That was chapter nine, to shield and deliver them. So from him comes the battle bow. From him, every ruler. Remember, we even saw last week that um, he will rule uh, chapter nine, verse, I'm looking across the page, verse 10. He, this coming one, the Messiah, will proclaim peace to the nations. He will, his rule will extend from sea to sea. He will rule all the nations, so all the rulers are going to be subject to him. Okay, so then in, in keeping with this thought about Judah, they are living in Judah. The people at this time are from Judah. And so God's reminding them, hey, it's from you, your tribe, that this cornerstone is going to come. And here's some great news for them. Verse 5, together they, the people of Judah, will be like mighty men trampling the muddy streets in battle because the Lord is with them. They will fight and overthrow the horsemen. Okay, he just said that, the God, that God's going to make them like a proud horse in battle. Now he's saying, rather than being weak and vulnerable and dumb as sheep, no. Or misguided and misled and fearful like sheep, no. Completely turning the tables around. God's going to make them like mighty warriors. Together with the Messiah, they will be like mighty men that will over fight and overthrow the horsemen. So, and we can, we can compare this with other prophetic scriptures, that God is actually, we'll read this when we get more toward the end of the book of Zechariah, that God is actually gonna use his people to fight with him. And they will be victorious. And he will make them as strong as King David in battle. And it's because, I'll never forget one of my, my friends from college, a good pastor friend of my husband, you know, talking about the great men of the Old Testament and what made them great and why were they successful. He said five words, the Lord was with him. And that's the whole reason for their success. It's the reason for our success in anything because the Lord is with us. And that's why they'll be victorious. Verse six, I will strengthen the house of Judah. So God's promise and he's gonna give them the strength and the ability to do this and save the house of Joseph. Now what's significant about that? The house of Joseph, that's a reference to the 10 Northern tribes. Remember, this is a divided kingdom. Ever since, you know, Saul, David, Solomon, then when Rehoboam took the throne, that's when the kingdom was divided between the 10 tribes to the North and two tribes to the South, and they were divided ever since. So the reference to the house of jo Joseph and in a minute, we're going to read about Ephraim. Remember, Ephraim is just another name. That was the largest tribe of the 10 tribes. Ephraim was one of the two sons of Joseph. And so often Ephraim is referred to, the name Ephraim refers to the 10 northern tribes, as does the house of Joseph. So when he says, I'm strengthening the house of Joseph and I will save the house of, or excuse me, the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph, I will restore them. They're going to one day be reunited. He's going to restore them again because I have compassion on them. And remember, the northern kingdom was the kingdom that went into exile first. They were taken away in 722 BC by the Assyrians. And then it was 150 some years later that Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonians. But God says this wonderful thing here, it will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God and I will answer them. So here's that, that reference to the Ephraimites. The Ephraimites, okay, of the house of Joseph, and we're talking again about the 10 northern tribes. So the Ephraimites will become like mighty men, just like the house of Judah, we read about in verse four. And five, their hearts will be glad as with wine. So they'll become mighty. God will strengthen them and give them so much joy, just like someone 
is happy when they drink wine. That's how uh, joyful they will be. And their children will see it and be joyful. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. So not only is God rescuing and bringing these two tribes back together again and making them mighty warriors and victorious against their enemies, but their children are going to see it. Their children are going to reap the, the benefit of those blessings. The, the blessing passes on to their children indefinitely, forever. And it says their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. And then something interesting he says here in verse 8, I will signal for them and gather them in. In Isaiah chapter 5, the Lord says, I will whistle for them. I remember growing up, my dad always whistled for us when we were, you know, way out in the woods or out in the yard. He did it with his fingers. I'd never have learned to whistle like that, but I can remember the sound of it was, hang on. Da, 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 da. That's how he would whistle, like really loud. So when we heard that, you know, daddy was calling us, we better get home now. And so often shepherds, whether it was with their fingers or a little pipe whistle, they would whistle for their sheep. You know, the Lord says that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, but they also know the whistle of the shepherd. And it, sometimes the shepherds also use a whistle. So this is a reference to God being that good shepherd that he's gonna woo, whistle for them and gather them in. We, you got to do a word study just on gather and like how many times you see that in the prophetic books that God's over and over and over. It's almost like ridiculously redundant how many times God said he's going to gather his people. He's going to gather them. He's going to gather them in. Surely I will redeem them and they'll be as numerous as before. Though I scatter them among the peoples and God had scattered them far and wide between the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Though I scatter them, yet in distance, distant lands, they will remember me. They and their children, there's those kids again, will survive and they will return. Return where? Return to their homeland, to the land of Israel. It's like there's going to be another exodus. Look at the next verse, verse 10. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. Okay, Egypt and Assyria. If you know anything about Old Testament history, those two countries ought to ring a bell. And why are they significant? Well, where were the Hebrews, the Israelites, enslaved for 400 years before God brought them out under the hand of Moses? In Egypt. So they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And then exile, or excuse me, Assyria, is the country of their exile. That was the first kingdom to take the 10 northern tribes away into captivity, into exile. They were drug away and chains by the wicked, barbaric Assyrians. And so God is reminding them of their history and that even, even those who are scattered there at this time, God is going to gather them back and bring them back to their land. And he mentions two specific regions here. I'll bring them to Gilead and Lebanon, and there will not be enough room for them. Okay, where are those places? Gilead, Gilead and Lebanon. So if, so if you think about the Jordan River that runs through the land of Israel, kind of toward the eastern side, remember as they came up uh, out of the desert before they crossed the Jordan into the promised land to conquer the land God was giving them, that three of the tribes asked to stay on the east side of the Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, half tribe of Manasseh, the other half crossed over. But why was that? Because it, they had large groups of livestock and cattle and it was perfect country for them on that side. So the Lord allowed them to settle on that side. So if you think of where, um, you know where the Sea of Galilee is, and then the river runs down to the Dead Sea, right? So if you're looking this way, this is east, okay? This is the uh, land of Canaan over here. So from the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, this section between there and the Dead Sea, 
the section off to the east, that whole region between, those, between the lake and the Dead Sea, that section was known as Gilead. It's kind of where most of Manasseh settled. And Lebanon, on the other side, to the north, so where Tyre and Sidon are, are located in the region of Lebanon, there's a whole series of uh, mountains in Lebanon. And Lebanon was famous for its cedar trees and cypress trees. They were known for their um, amazing timber. And originally, these were allotted to uh, Asher, this region of Lebanon. But over time, of course, through warfare and you know, the warring kingdoms, they would lose that territory. So Lebanon's in the north, on the northeast along the coast, and then Gilead is, is east of the Jordan. So we're talking about both sides of the river. So God is using these two names, and, and uh, these, some of these areas, had, had, they had lost that territory and their history, especially before being taken into exile. But God's going to bring them back to those regions because those two regions were, were very fertile areas. And so this is the way of God saying, I'm going to bless you amazingly, bring you back to this rich, fruitful, prosperous land. And not only that, there's not going to be enough room for you. There's going to be so many of you that I'm bringing back. Verse 11, they will pass through the sea of trouble. Now, some translations, and I've read several different translations, and it might get confusing because some say he or the Lord will pass through the sea of trouble. Think of like the Lord going straight through the Red Sea, you know, leading the uh, Israelites all the way through the Dead Sea. So whichever way you take it, the, the truth is this, that, that in this second exodus, there's going to be a period of trouble. So before all these promises that God is making will come about throughout their history, there's going to be several periods of trouble. But even before the second coming of Messiah, there's going to be a period of trouble. They will pass through the sea of trouble. But the promise is that the surging sea will be subsided. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be rough, dark, stormy waters. We call it the seven-year tribulation. Several references in the Old Testament have different names for it. One of the, the more popular names uh, from Jeremiah is the time of Jacob's trouble. That there will be this period that Israel will be greatly persecuted before they are divinely rescued by God. So there's this hint of that here, them having to pass through, and yet the surging sea will be subsided, and all the depths of the Nile will dry up, and Assyria's pride will be brought down. So those who took you captive, those who were barbaric and, and persecuted you mercilessly, uh, those who took you away to their, into exile, and you know they were a very, very proud nation. And they got conquered by the Babylonians. And it also says Egypt's scepter will pass away. So Egypt, no, the, the great pharaohs of Egypt, you know, that they rise and they fall, they rise and they fall. So what's God promising here? Once again, he's going to deal with her enemies. They will persecute her no more. The places where they have been dispersed into these countries, God's going to judge those nations as he gathers his people back to his homeland. And then the final promise in this chapter, verse 12, I will strengthen them in the Lord. So it's not in your own ability. It's not in these false gods. It's not in your own self-righteousness. The only reason that they will prosper at all is because God is going to strengthen them. He will make them prosper. And for what purpose? Why is he bringing them back into this land? I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. They will walk in the name of the Lord. They will be that treasured possession, his faithful people, his holy people. When we see some more verses later in the book of Zechariah about exactly what God will do for his people, he will make them a holy nation once again. But at this point, he's just reminding them once more throughout this chapter that although they may be like scattered sheep now, he's promising that he is going to care for them, he's going to rescue them, he's going to send Messiah 
who's going to fight with them. He's going to reunite the nation. He's going to gather them in from the distant lands, strengthen them so that they will walk in his name. So again, we have more of these incredible promises that God is making to the people there in the land of Judah. Now, again, and as you, sometimes it's very difficult when you read through these prophetic books and these chapters because, again, there were always near fulfillments. Sometimes there were distant fulfillments and then far future fulfillments of the same things that God was saying. But this, for sure, we know is all pointing to, and from this point on, of course, the whole book is really, but especially from this point forward, it's really pointing toward Messiah and his second coming when there's going to be this great exodus and God will bring them back to the land and fight for them and then rule and reign with them. So it's still to happen. God said it's going to happen. It will happen. We have that to look forward to. And the one thing I always want to remind you week after week is everything that God said that already came to pass just gives us that greater assurance that every promise that has yet to happen will come to pass because as he said, he will do it. Amen? Amen.